Well, hello again, and welcome back to Preterist Apologetics. See, I got it right that time, Mike. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and uh, we're a little bit late. We're, we're showing this program on Sunday because I was out of pocket on Friday evening when Mike and I normally uh, film. My wife has been having a lot of health issues this week. She was in the ER on Thursday night. She's been in bed ever since. Um, not at the hospital. She's she's at our house. So anyway, it, it's not been a happy time for her, bless her heart. And uh, anyway, I I completely, totally, 100% forgot. And, you know, during the time I was tending to my wife, trying to run errands for her and get her something to eat that, you know, uh, what is that, plain liquid diet? Oh, uh, yuck. <laughs> uh. Uh, so anyway, uh, this and that and the other, completely forgot about uh, filming until almost, I think it was 830. I'm walking through the living room and I'm actually on my way to the bedroom to see if there's anything else I can get for her before I turn in. And it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> it's like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> You got all these texts for me. Hey, Don, are you there? Everything yeah, okay? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, you know what? Guess what, Mike? I didn't get your text on my phone until this morning. Uh, okay. Honest to goodness. Uh, because I picked up the phone at 830. I had it plugged in for recharge. I ran over, grabbed the phone to see if you had texted me. There were no messages there last night or hmm. a Friday night. I go, well, okay. Did we... Did we postpone this? And I forgot it. Well, you know, I don't know what happened. Uh, but then when I came into the office this afternoon, about four o'clock, uh, there were some passages that I wanted to look at. Um, I picked my phone up and there were, there were your messages. They weren't there during the day. They, they showed up this afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, my phone's really been doing some funky things lately. I'm going to have, uh, of course, it, it's an iPhone 6. And so my oh. wife says, you really ought to come into the 21st century. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got to update that. Definitely. So anyway, well, welcome back folks. Uh, sorry for the delay, but Mike and I want to pick up on some things that we've been looking at a good little bit. And that is Doug Wilson's appeal uh, to Hebrews chapter one, Psalms 102, and of course, Romans chapter eight for his concept of the redemption of creation. Uh, and we segued from that into, well, we looked at Psalms 102 and we pointed out several things. Uh, Mike, if you want to give us just a real brief review of what we looked at on Psalms 102 and lead us into Episunagogi, because that's what we want to do. <laughs> okay, the gathering, yeah. So we started at verse 13. I mean, the whole chapter is just rich with eschatology. And we have these same themes that are present pretty much going all the way back to Isaiah 56 to Isaiah 66, with a nation being born, the heavens and the earth, and the new heavens and the new earth, and the resurrection. All of these same themes are connected to Psalm 102, but Wilson arbitrarily takes a preterist interpretation of Isaiah you know, 60 through 66 and Revelation 21 and 22, but then claims that somehow I uh, Psalm 102 is like an island unto itself. And I think that's a, a huge mistake. But we started at verse 13. You will arise and have pity on Zion. It is the time to favor her. This is the comforting also of Isaiah, comforting Jerusalem. The appointed time has come. And we started there and we went back to... Um, you know, where Jesus talks about the appointed time in Luke 21, verse 8, and also, you know, the gathering into the kingdom, the kingdom coming in verse 32. And so there was this appointed time that was coming. The false prophets, he said, don't listen to the false prophets when they say the time is near because the Great Commission has to be fulfilled first, and then the appointed time will be near in that specific generation. And then we also looked at the appointed time in Romans, Romans 8. Again, this is a text that Doug appeals to. And the appointed time, Kairos, is used there as well, also in Romans 13, 11, and 12. So we're, we're having all of these themes that the New Testament writers are seeing that the resurrection was imminent. It, that was the appointed time. 
Then we went down to verse 18. Let this be recorded for a generation to come so that a people yet to be created or born may praise the Lord. Now, I had mentioned that generation here, I made some connections to Deuteronomy 32 verses 5 and 20 and also verse 21 with this nation, Gentile nation is going to make the Jews jealous. And I'm sticking with that. A lot of commentators said, well, you know, this is referring, he's writing down the prophecy as if it's already been fulfilled so that the generations of the Jews of Israel will be able to look back and, and see its fulfillment. But I saw another commentary that I, I agreed with, and he said that there's some Hebrew parallelism here between a generation to come and that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. In other words, when this generation comes, that's when the people are going to be created. And so I'm kind of sticking to my guns on that that parallel with um, Deuteronomy 32 on this terminal generation. And we looked at, you know, how Peter sees the terminal gen generation of uh, Deuteronomy 32 and Acts 2 and also in First Peter that the end was near. Then we looked at verses 21 and 22, and this is where we're going to get in tonight. That says this that they may declare in Zion the name of the Lord and in Jerusalem his praise when the peoples gather together and kingdoms to worship the Lord. Now, I'm going to turn it over to you in just a second, Don, but, you know, this gathering and scattering really goes all the way back to the garden. Mm -hmm. When Adam was formed from the dust, he was taken from the dust outside the garden and put, gathered into God's presence in the covenant relationship. When he sinned, the sin, the death came through. Now Adam is going to die a bad death. He's going to, he's placed outside of the garden, outside of God's presence. And that, so what we're talking about here, folks, is when scattered you're scattered from god's presence is death when you're gathered into his presence it's resurrection life and this is repeated throughout israel's history israel now becomes a corporate adam all right and so when she's disobedient to the covenant she is scattered out of the land when she repents she's gathered back in the land and that is a resurrection and so this pattern repeats until we get to the New Testament. So that, you know, for an introduction, I think that's that's kind of where we're going now. I'll, I'll turn it over to you to get into some specifics. You know, I think that's extremely well stated. When, when we see this story of, of Adam being recapitulated everywhere, just it, it, and let's be honest, Mike, Um a, quote, casual reading of the Bible from a Western perspective would never come to this. You know, uh, I, I've got to share something with you that happened yesterday at, at my bank that I, I came out, I came out just nearly skipping. OK, uh, I had to go in and get some a little, few little financial details corrected that the bank had gotten wrong and I was confused by it. But anyway, I go in. And uh, the gal that was waiting on me, uh, I was asking about a deposit from YouTube, okay, for my videos. And she goes, why do you get money from YouTube? I said, well, I, I do videos. I said, I'm, I'm on YouTube generally five days a week. Well, a gal over on the end, there's three, three gals at the counter. The gal over at the end, she goes, Oh, what's the subject of your YouTubes? I said, Bible prophecy. And she goes, oh, that's cool. Gal next to her in the middle, she goes, well, yeah, that's just really awesome. Well, what do you say? Floodgates opened. <laughs> right. And I, I gave them, you know, just a super thumbnail sketch. And I, the gal on the end, she says, okay, so do you talk about the river's going to be turning to blood and the stars going to fall from sky just any day now? And I said, no, ma'am, that, that's not what I say. <laughs> uh, and she said, well, what do you teach? I said, well, I don't believe we're in the last days. I don't believe the world's about to end. I don't believe time's going to end. And all three of them are going, 
that's fascinating. Nice. How do you, why do you say that? And I said, uh, and I jokingly said, I said, okay, can I get on a soapbox here? Can we film what I'm about to do? Cause it's going to get good ladies. <laughs> <laughs> and they all laughed real big. And I said, look, ladies, all, all of us were raised in what's known as a Grecian worldview, also known as Occidental. And I said, that means we take things more literally. And the Bible was written by Hebrews, and they looked at things poetically, metaphorically, figuratively. And the gal in the middle spoke up, and she said, yeah, and another thing. The Hebrews thought corporately, not individually. And I'm going, really? I'm going, whoa. whoa, I want to hug this girl. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> who, who are you? Right. I mean, she was just, and she just started telling the other two ladies. She said, you know, here in America, we, we emphasize the individual. Hebrews, uh, they emphasize community. They emphasize nation. They didn't emphasize the individual. I'm going, you go, girl. <laughs> you preach Cor it. Corporate, corporate body. Yeah, corporate body. And so I picked up on that and I said, here's the problem. I said, I was raised as, as you guys were believing that the coming of the Lord is when Jesus as a five foot five Jewish man rides a literal cloud out of heaven and puts a, an end to time. And they're going, yeah, no, that's the way we're raised. Yeah. I said, well, I learned, I said, here's your big term for the day. You can write this down and learn this. I said, I became familiar with Hebraic apocalyptic and they're going, what, <laughs> you know? And so they repeated it. And I said, let me give you, for instance, I said, this is just one, but I said, um, in 721 BC, Yahweh used in his sovereignty, used the Assyrians to destroy the 10 Northern tribes. And the gal in the middle says, yeah, that's just historical fact. I go, okay, this girl's done a little more study than most. And I said, that's exactly right. This is historical fact. We know it happened 721 BC. I said, but guess what? The book of Micah says that in the destruction of the 10 Northern tribes, God came out of heaven, walked on tops of the mountains and the earth melted beneath his feet. I said, ladies, I think we can all agree that literal earth wasn't destroyed in 721 BC. And they're going, wow, that's cool. So, I, I say all of that, and it 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 went on, and we just had, we had a fantastic time talking there, the four of us. And they were just this little question, that little question. So I told them I was going to bring them some of my little small books for them to divide among themselves, and they were just well, they seemed ecstatic about it. Nice. But I say all of that to emphasize the problem that we as preterists face, and that's getting people to look at the Bible through Hebraic eyes. Mm -hmm. instead of mm -hmm. modern, you know, 21st century mentality, uh, words, terms, and phrases being just defined by our modern society. It just doesn't work. Uh, I've been going back and forth on Facebook with a guy, and he, he is defining every single word in the scriptures that he brings forth from the modern perspective. He has no concept of, of audience relevance has no concept of Jewish apocalyptic. I mean, he just, he totally ignores, completely and totally ignores everything that I point out. So when we talk about this concept of the gathering and we talk about the first Adam and the second Adam, when we talk about the scattering and the regathering, et cetera, et cetera, we have to, we have to spend the time to devote the time and the energy to go back through the Tanakh and to see how this imagery, and it is imagery, to see how this imagery is being played out, how God uses this language to, de to describe and to define his relationship with Israel and with mankind. And unless we're willing to put in this time, look, Mike, I had a guy tell me, a minister right here in Arden, Oklahoma, tell me years ago, after he had condemned me as a heretic and I was trying to point these things out. He said, look, if I can't pick up the Bible and first Corinthians 15 and read it and understand it exactly like I would uh, the, the local newspaper, I don't want anything to do with the Bible. <clears throat> and it's just like, 
good grief. There's something well, tr tragically wrong here. Well, Don, let me jump in real quick. And so far, a partial preterist like Wilson would be tracking right with you, right with us. You know, you got to understand the apocalyptic language, all this. But then they get the blinders on when we get to 1 Corinthians 15. They understand covenant in terms of heavens and earth, right? Mm -hmm. And they understand corporate body to a certain extent. But once we get into 1 Corinthians 15 and 2 Corinthians 5, it's like they will not study anymore. Yeah, it, it's, it's like they refuse to go beyond anything else. And and that's that's my frustration is even though they can see all the parallels, they can see the analogy of faith. But because of the creeds and be, then they start being the futurist that or the dispensationalist that they they're constantly trying to educate about apocalyptic language and so forth in Matthew 24. Um, and then when they get into first Corinthians 15, they don't they don't want to study with us. They don't want to dig into the meaning of these words, mortal, immortality, uh, you know, futility yes. um, and look at body in a different way. So. Uh, I, what you're saying is absolutely 100% correct. And then on the other side of that, they don't study what we are saying enough to fully understand what we are saying. And so they misrepresent us. Yeah, that's another. You know, on, on Facebook over the last couple of days, uh, Philip Kayser, Robert Kirkshank, our, mm. our good friend, uh, we've been having this ongoing dialogue. Philip Kayser seems to be a really nice guy, very cordial, very respectful in his dialogue. But he accused us of full prints as developing our hermeneutic from the non-biblical literature and imposing that hermeneutic on the Bible. And Robert and I are, are both going, uh, wait a minute, <laughs> that's not right. Uh, and he yeah. even said that I did that. He said that he had read a ton of full printers books and that they, inclusive of me, are constantly citing these Gnostic uh, pseudepigraphal uh, writings as if they are authoritative for determining our hermeneutic. Well, I posted and I said, well, Dr. Kayser, with all due respect, you say you've read a lot of my material. I said, can you document from any of my books where I have ever cited a single one of these extra biblical writings, non-canonical writings, and use them as the determinative hermeneutical uh, principle? I right. said, I use the scripture. I said, now, do I sometimes quote these pseudepigraphal sources? Yes, but it's in corroboration. Right. It's and important. Robert Robert chimed in correctly and said, look, we've got to understand the biblical writers didn't write in a vacuum. And I, I picked up on that and said, the Old Testament writers, the New Testament writers were intimately familiar with the writings, with the beliefs, with the sayings and the literature of their pagan friends. Yes. And they very often use them. Now they might subvert the meaning, the pagan applications, and take the language and apply it to Yahweh to prove his superiority over their pagan gods. That's not the point. They don't change the figurative to the literal. <laughs> yes. Now, does Kaiser take a literal rapture in AD 70? He takes a physical resurrection in I... AD 70. So the gathering of Matthew 24, 31 and the catching away of first Thessalonians. I mean, I know he takes that, that catching away is 80, 70. So I'm not sure what he understands the living uh, go through at that, but I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I, okay. I've got to read a bunch of, um, I've got to read a bunch of his literature. Someone asked me today if I would be willing to have a debate with him. And I said, oh. sure, you know, be, yeah, I challenged to. him to a debate. He he doesn't want to do it, but you can try. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I had forgotten that you had done that. So anyway, I told this individual, I said, sure, contact him. And I said, we can have an internet dialogue. You know, we can just kind of go back and forth, if you please. Uh, do it that way. It may not be a formal debate, but just a good informal conversation. Uh, because he does seem to be respectful. And that's something yeah. I you know, I highly prize. So we'll see what develops from that. But I asked him a question 
which is my final post of today to him, I said, and I reiterated the fact that, okay, yeah, I'll occasionally cite an extra biblical source that agrees with what I find in scripture hermeneutically. But I said, my question to you is, if a New Testament writer cites, quotes, or echoes, to use Hayes' terminology, an Old Testament text that is demonstrably metaphoric, figurative, non-literal, then how should we view that New Testament citation of that Old Testament metaphoric passage? Do we automatically assume the New Testament writer is now applying it literally? And if so, upon what principle do we assume that? And I just posted that about an hour before coming on air here. So, you know, it remains to be seen uh, if if he will answer that or if he gives an answer. And I'm really eager to see uh, if he will. I, and, and, he, and he surely would, a partial predator surely would. You know, when it comes to apocalyptic language, Isaiah 13, Isaiah 19, Isaiah 34, to help us understand the language of Matthew 24. But again, once we get into 1 Corinthians 15, and Paul is quoting Hosea 13, and he's quoting Isaiah 25, now that hermeneutic kind of goes out the window. They don't want to look at that corporate body, what kind of death is being discussed there, and so forth, but... Well, they want to set aside, as we've said before, they want to set aside, as you've already stated here, the, the hermeneutical principles that they use in other passages uh, to posit an AD 70 fulfillment. And then when we say, look, let, let's apply the very principles that you apply over here to 1 Corinthians 15, it's almost like, oh, heavens no, we can't do that. You know, right. uh, uh, Strimple in arguing against the preterist view of first Corinthians 15 said, I don't see the word Israel in all of first Corinthians 15. And back when Sam Frost was thinking somewhat correctly, uh, he said the entire context of first Corinthians 15 is about Israel and her promises. And of course he cited rightly. So Paul's own statements for the hope of the promise of the resurrection in my own trial, hope of the promise of the resurrection is the hope of the 12 tribes to which they earnestly seek to attain daily and on and on, you know. So, uh, you know, in fact, Sam Frost said in response to Shrimple, if you're going to demand that every single eschatological text mentions every single eschatological tenet or element, you're imposing an artificial journalistic principle on them, which is just completely unrealistic. Oh. And which they wouldn't do under normal circumstances. Right. And then, and yet Sam wrote a forward in uh, Steve Gregg's book. You know, <laughs> Sam has just gone so far. Uh, well, yeah. That's a He's whole beyond world. left field. Yeah, we know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, we want to look at the gathering here of Psalms 102. Now, folks, this gathering is at the time of the coming of the Lord for the glorification of Zion. Let, let's, not, let's not overlook that because this is absolutely critical to understand. In this book that I have written, which I'm so frustrated, uh, it's going to get published. I've got a guy who is a professional uh, who works on PDFs all the time. He works in publishing full time. Uh, he has undertaken to take my manuscript to set it up to where it will be accepted uh, by my publisher. Uh, he's been at it for a month now, and I, I'm just so thankful for him. But in the book, I have a special study, a special chapter on the Episunagogi, which is nothing less than, folks, listen to me very carefully, the Episunagogi is resurrection. It is resurrection. Mike touched on something a moment ago. Let me reiterate. Mike pointed out that this narrative of Adamic death, fellowship, sin, scattering, is likewise the story of Israel. She becomes, the, she becomes this Adam, uh, at playing out the narrative of Adam. Israel sinned. Israel was scattered. What happened when Israel was scattered? Well, 
Isaiah chapter 27, 9 and 10, has he, Yahweh, stricken him, that is Israel, as he has struck those who struck him? And the answer is, in part, by sending her away. God killed Israel by sending her into captivity. Hosea chapter 13, 1 and 2. When Ephraim humbled himself, he was exalted before the Lord. But when Israel sinned, he died. Yet, <laughs> yet he sinned more and more. Now, I don't, you know, Mike, I think it's kind of hard to have dead people sinning. Kind of a tough one. So yes. here we have Israel in sin being slain by God. Hosea chapter 5 and 6. He has slain us with the word of his mouth. Now, these are living people being sent off into captivity and saying he has slain us. And, of course, you have Ezekiel 37 in the vision of the valley of dry bones where all 12 tribes are depicted as dead in captivity. This is the motif, ladies and gentlemen. This is the scattering aspect. So the scattering is death, just like Adam died the day he ate because he was cast out of the garden, separated from God. And, and let's make this observation, ladies and gentlemen, both Hebrew and Greek, the word for death is separation or means separation. So that gives us an idea right off the bat that when we're talking about death, we're actually, actually talking about some kind of separation. Adam was separated from God, thrown out of the garden the day he ate. That was the death he died that day. Israel cast out of the garden the land that flowed with milk and honey. This land called beautiful. She was cast out when she sinned. When she was cast out, she died. Yet God gave the promise that he would gather her regather her, and the key eschatological word for this gathering, now there, there are two or three, uh, well, there's one word and some cognates of it. There's the episunagogi, which is, of course, a compound word, epi, upon, you know, kind of piled on, sunagogi, which is gathering. Sunagogi is the word that we get synagogue from. What was a synagogue? Well, it was a place where everybody gathered on the Sabbath. So that's the concept. Those, those are the motifs and things that are brought out with episynagogi, sunago, synagogi. Those are the three words, the cognates, that are used to describe the eschatological gathering. Now, I, I'm going to I'm going to overlook some passages that we that we could adduce tonight. Okay. Right. Because there's a bunch of them. And yeah, it, I, I noticed that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, to tell you, there's a bunch of them. But I want, I want to pick on just a, a few of the incredible ones. I want to spend a little bit of time on a passage that I brought forth two weeks ago, and that's Isaiah 43. Now, Isaiah 43 is a passage that, as I pointed out two weeks ago, contains the promise of the creation of a new people, just like Psalms 102. But let's begin with Isaiah 43 and God in promising the second Exodus. He said, yeah, also, also Isaiah 11 with the second Exodus. But oh, sure, yeah. there, there, it's the second time I will redeem you. Uh, so there's the explicit reference to the second Exodus. But I want you to notice here in Psalms, or excuse me, Isaiah 53, when you, pass, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you go through the waters, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. I am the Lord your God. Now watch this, ladies and gentlemen. I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have, or I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place, since you were precious in my sight and you have been honored and I have loved you. 
So here is Yahweh taking note of how he once redeemed Israel in the first Exodus. Now notice what he says. Mm -hmm. Here's what I did. I redeemed you and ransomed you from Egypt. I now also, I will give men for you and people for your life. This is the second Exodus, and God says there's going to be a second ransom, a second redemption. And and just to interject real quickly, our passage has second Exodus motifs in it. Absolutely. It talks about groaning, and so that, that theme is present in Psalm 102 as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, watch this, folks. He is promising, first of all, once again, because this is so important, he is saying, I redeemed you at one time. I ransomed you. I gave Egypt for you. I gave Sheba for you, et cetera, et cetera. I gave men for you instead of you. They died. You didn't. And now I will give men for you. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says, in whom that is in Christ. Well, who's Christ? Second Moses in whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of our sins. Folks, th this is the second X. Ephesians chapter one, scholar after scholar after scholar, you know, R.T. France, N.T. Wright, all these guys, they recognize that both the Colossians and Ephesians use over and over second Exodus language. Yeah, Tom Holland as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Tom Holland as well. So here we have all this language of the second exodus. Now, what did God promise in Isaiah 43, the second exodus? And he said, I'm going to give men for you. Well, in Ephesians, Jesus Christ is given for us. But guess what? There was a redemption yet future. The day of redemption, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Christ hmm. was the sacrificial Passover for the redemption, just like in Exodus 12 to 14, the lamb was slain, the Passover lamb, so that Israel, those under the power of that lamb sacrifice, were not slain. But then, in addition to the lamb, what did God do? He killed the Egyptians. Mm, yeah, as a ransom price for their freedom. Exactly right. And exactly. also, and also <clears throat> killing their firstborn. And of course, Jesus is the firstborn. <laughs> So you have all these. All these connections. So now in Ephesians chapter 1, in whom, that is in Christ the Passover, we have redemption. But now he says you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of the yes. redemption. Yes. This is the outplaying of Isaiah 43. Well, uh, who was going to be Egypt? and Sheba, <laughs> and Dedan, that were going to perish in the second Exodus. Mm, Revelation 11. Uh, uh, the great city bought Sodom is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Egypt. And this city called Babylon is um, where the Lord was crucified. Hmm. Yes. Galatians 4. <laughs> I mean... Uh, the 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 idea and the concept of Jerusalem being the new Egypt, the mm. enslaving Egypt, Torah, the law being the enslaving power permeates Poland literature. Yes, uh, just like um, Babylon was an enslaving, persecuting mountain, and so Israel has become apostate. So now she is that enslaving, um, you know, come out of her, come out of Babylon, absolutely. Come, come out of Egypt, my people. I, I really like the way N.T. Wright and R.T. France especially, I think Holland does it some as well, but they point out how <clears throat> Jesus in his ministry very often quotes from passages in which Old Covenant Israel was being oppressed by the pagans. Mm -hmm. But now Jesus yeah, is talking about it's his followers that are being oppressed by the Jewish leaders, and thus the Jewish leaders and powers in Jerusalem have become the pagan sources. Yes. And I even have a couple of dispensational sources who say the same identical thing, by the way. 
I was shocked when I found those, but nonetheless, there are some, they recognize this. Yeah. Israel became the enemy of God in the New Testament time. We find that in Philippians chapter three, but I won't go there. So we have in, in Isaiah 40 through this, Isaiah 43, this grand promise of the second exodus. Well, what's the second exodus going to do? It's going to result in this new people with a new name. And let's let's continue our uh, examination here. Um, I, let me, from the west, I will gather you. Uh, I will exactly. say to the north, give up. And to the south, do not withhold. Being my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. And so he's he's calling all of Israel together. And in other passages in Isaiah, he's calling the Gentiles with them. Absolutely. I, and that's the point. Here, he is saying, I'm going to gather my people. Well, the, gather, the people have been scattered. They were scattered by the Assyrians. They were scattered by the Babylonians. Let, let's 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 address an elephant in the room real quick because some of especially modern uh commentators they're gonna say well you know this second exodus all the way from isaiah especially 56 through 66 and and these second exodus they're referring to israel coming back under the time of ezra and nehemiah coming back into the land we i typologically i don't have a problem with that but what they I don't know how much of them neglect it, but the Jews understood that that was not the fulfillment. That's right. They understood these passages, not the, just like uh, Haggai, Haggai two, you know, the, the glory of this temple is going to exceed. And they looked at it and they said, no, nah, yeah, it can't be. Else. Yeah. And so there was a, some kind of a second exodus when they were gathered back in the land under Ezra and Nehemiah, but all the Jews understood this is not the ultimate fulfillment. Messiah, the ultimate fulfillment is a gathering in Messiah. Now, they didn't understand exactly what right. that was. A point well taken, and it's one that, again, back to refer back to N.T. Wright. N.T. Wright points out, and he cites, by the way, he cites all of these extra biblical sources. <laughs> You know, uh, that's inside joke here, folks. Uh, right. But anyway, he cites all of these extra biblical sources to show that the Jews believe that somehow, some way, because of their continuing sin, they were still in bondage. Even though they were in Jerusalem, even though they were back in Judea and, the, and they controlled the city of Jerusalem, they were still in bondage. They were waiting on the true, ultimate second exodus to deliver them from sin into the glorious kingdom, and they saw that as resurrection. So uh, it's a point well taken there, Mike, that we have to see what others are saying. Well, this is the true explanation of the second exodus. It's not what the Jews believed about it at all. They did not see the Babylonian return as the fulfillment of passages like 43. And let's look at it like this. The psalmist in Isaiah predicted that at the time of this second exodus, a new people would be created. Well, what, what new people were created in the return from Babylonian or Assyrian captivity? Uh, what new name was given? And what about the calling of the Gentiles? Did, did the Jews all of a sudden uh, become evangelistic uh, to the Gentiles? After the Babylonian captivity? <laughs> well, that's a joke, <laughs> you know. There were isolated incidents, as we know that from Matthew chapter 23. <clears throat> but insofar as a concerted mainline philosophy of practice, that is that is absolutely not what happened. And so when you look at the, the descriptive language of Isaiah 65, Isaiah 66, of what would what would be realized in this new creation, this new heaven and new earth of a new people with a new name, et cetera, et cetera, None of that came true. Well, that's where the bias and that's where the liberalism of these higher critics come in. They say, well, obviously it didn't happen. That was just a, that was an unrealistic expectation and the prophecy failed. Well, you know, for those of us who accept the inspiration of scripture, that is not an acceptable definition or answer to these prophecies. So here is Yahweh. Once again, as Mike read for us, I'm going to call my sons and the daughters from the north and south, from the east 
and the West, and also rightly observed he was going to call the Gentiles. By the way, here, here's a very, very important point, especially in modern-day discussions. We're told that God's focus, exclusive focus of salvation was Israel and Israel only, that never had a promise for the Gentiles. Well, when we come to the book of Isaiah, especially, it's found in other books as well, Zechariah especially, but when we come to the book of Isaiah especially, what do we find? We have the promise of the redemption of Zion. Well, wait a minute. The redemption of Zion would be the redemption and restoration of all 12 tribes, not just two tribes. And then when we see these promises of the redemption of Zion, Isaiah 60, 61, 62, when we see those promises, what else do we find? Well, let's see. We can go back to Isaiah 49, 6 and following. Speaking of and to Messiah, it is too small of a thing for you to be the redeemer of Israel and to bring salvation to the tribes of Jacob. Well, what are the 12 tribes of Jacob? That's the 12 tribes. It's not just two. It's not just three or four. The tribes of Jacob is a reference to all 12 tribes. So here is Yahweh anticipating the salvation of all Israel, Romans 11. But he said, I will also, in addition to the fact that you're going to redeem the tribes of Jacob and save Israel, I will also make you a light to the Gentiles. Yes. So when people talk about the salvation of Israel and say, oh, it's just for Israel. No, no, no. God was going to save Israel, going to return Israel to him in, in covenant fellowship through the new covenant. But at the same time, he's going to bring the Gentiles into his glory. Yeah. That cannot be ignored or denied. Yeah. And, and going on with that, Isaiah 56, 7 and 8. These I will bring to my holy mountain, Isaiah 2, um, and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The sovereign Lord declares, he who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. So we've and got that, the Gentiles in here. That's exactly right. This, this is the point I'm making. He would gather Israel. He would redeem Israel. And that's the whole house of Israel. But in addition, I will also bring others beside them. Hey, listen, even the Jews understood that was calling the Gentiles. Yeah. But they didn't like it. <laughs> you know, some of those who were so focused on Israel, they didn't, may not have liked it, but it was there and they understood that it was there. Okay. So here is this episunagogi. In Isaiah chapter 43, which is a passage that Jesus directly echoes. I say Isaiah 43 and verse 10. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. Uh, boy, you know, Mike, when we understand the power of that verse, when Jesus cites it and applies it to him in Acts chapter one, saying to his apostles, you are my witnesses. Wait a minute. That's what Yahweh, the father said. Well, mm -hmm. Jesus wasn't claimed to be the father. He was certainly claiming to be even or one with the father. Exactly. And R.T. France comments on this uh, to a great extent of how Jesus was appropriating the language that was used of Yahweh and applying it to himself. Never that he was saying that he was Yahweh, but always identifying himself with the deity of Yahweh. And boy, that's powerful. But again, what is this witnessing to be for? It's for the episunagogi. Now, for our for our dispensational friends who insist on literalism, okay, then that should mean that in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus said, you're going to go and you're going to preach in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth, and when he Verse said, eight. 
you are my witnesses, okay, to do what? To gather. And yet, strangely enough, guess what? W.D. Davies in his in his book, uh, The Gospel in the Land, says it is more remark more than remarkable, and it is telling, rough paraphrase here, that Paul and none of his apostles ever lays an emphasis on the land. And here's here's the application of that. Nowhere, nowhere in Pauline literature do we ever say, now folks, um, I'm converting those of you who are the diaspora in Antioch of Pisidia, you know, uh, or anywhere else in Macedonia, Achaia, Asia, etc. Uh, I'm converting you scattered Israelites, and I want you to get back to Jerusalem post-haste. Paul was doing the gathering, but he wasn't gathering them geographically. Right. Yeah. Here is Paul's interpretation of the episunagogi foretold by Isaiah chapter 43. Well, yeah, I mean, even Genesis 49, 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come and unto, and to him shall be the gathering of the people. This was a messianic passage the Jews understood, but they just didn't understand what that gathering was going to look like. They interpreted it just like their history. Oh, we're gathered in the land and there's going to be a physical resurrection in the land and and Paul's like, no, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ, in Christ, not in the land. That's exactly right. And um, <clears throat> let me see. I've tried. I had, my goodness. Yeah, on, on Genesis 49, 10, I read a quote somewhere. I haven't been able to find it again, but it was by, by a Jewish rabbi saying Genesis 49, 10 was an extremely, quote, troubling, unquote, passage. And someone asked him, well, why, Rabbi? Why is it so troubling? Because he said, it says, when Messiah comes, the scepter will pass from Judah to, to Messiah, and Judah will no longer be the focus Messiah okay. will be. Uh, he, he he understood that, the, okay, here's the good news, and here's the bad news. <laughs> now it's like, now please read Paul. <laughs> Please read Paul. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So anyway, this Isaiah 43, I mean, when we look at it through the prism of the New Testament interpretation of how these New Testament writers took these Old Testament prophecies and applied them, as you pointed out, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, all the promises of God are yea and nay in Christ. And you see how they are applying these <clears throat> messianically, and they never apply them physically or literally of any visible manifestation. And it's just like Jesus said, by the way, Episodagogi, Matthew chapter 23 and verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Thou that kills the prophets, how often I would have gathered you to gather. As a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you were not willing. Wait a minute. Episunagogi. That's the gathering of Isaiah 43. Did Jesus ever go to any of the cities of, Jer of Israel saying, y'all come down to Jerusalem now <laughs> because that's where it's going to happen and that's where we're going to live? No, just like we pointed out a couple of weeks ago, uh, two or four maybe, Zion, Isaiah chapter 2, all of these Old Testament Isaiahic passages especially that talk about the gathering to Israel and the gathering to Zion, here in Hebrews chapter 12, you have come to Mount Zion. Well, what is this? You have come. That's the episodagogy. And we brought up, since we've already brought up Isaiah chapter 56, let's go there and um, actually, you know, we really ought to look at Isaiah 49. Um, yeah, verses 22 and 23. Yeah, Isaiah 49, 22 and 23. Uh, 
Behold, I will lift my hand in an oath to the nations. I will set up my standard for the people that they shall bring your sons in their arms and your daughters shall be carried on your shoulders. Kings shall be your foster fathers, your queens, your nursing mothers. They shall bow down to you with their faces to the earth and lick up the dust of your feet. Then you shall know that I am the Lord for they shall not be ashamed who wait for me. Well, the word episunagogi is not specifically used there. Uh, uh, I don't remember that being specifically there, but it's the gathering nonetheless. Right. And let's look earlier. I've already cited Isaiah chapter 49. Look at verse eight, eight and nine. In an acceptable time, I have heard you. In the day of salvation, I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people. That's that's Jesus being given as the covenant. Jesus is the new covenant. Now watch, to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages, heritages, that you may say to the prisoners, go forth to those who are in darkness, show yourself. By the way, that's resurrection, folks. Mm-hmm. Those who are in darkness, you know, in the Old Testament scriptures, darkness is death. Death is darkness. So anyway, they shall feed along the roads. they and their pastures shall be on all the desolate heights. They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither neither heat nor sun shall strike them. For the one who has mercy on them will lead them. Even by the springs of water, he will guide them and make and will make each of my mountains a road and my highways shall be elevated. Surely they shall come from afar. Look, those from the north and the west, these from the, from the land of Sinaiim. Uh, wait a minute. Didn't Psalms 102? Talk about they come from afar. I'm going to bring my sons and your daughters from the north, south, east, and the west. So even though, again, the word episodagogy is not used specifically, explicitly here, the concept is. Now, here's the thing that blows me away. The very first time I saw this, it's, it, it, has, it had to have been 45 years ago, Mike. It's that long ago that I saw this. In the acceptable time I've heard you, in the day of salvation I've helped you. And here's Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. After saying in chapter 5, 16 and following, God has committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation. What is the ministry of reconciliation? Well, it's Isaiah 49, 6 and following. It is too small of a thing for you to be the redeemer of Israel and a savior of the tribes of Jacob. Well, that means he's going to bring Let's see, he's going to reconcile Israel with Judah. I will also make you a light to the Gentiles. Going to reconcile Jew and Gentile. This is such incredible, beautiful stuff. So Paul says, God has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, we beseech you as if God is in us, be reconciled unto God. As it is written, see that chapter division is horrible. <laughs> it's really bad. In the acceptable time I've heard thee, and the day of salvation I've succored thee, behold, Paul said, now, that's his now, is the acceptable time. Now, wait a minute. What was going to happen in this acceptable time? I'm going to gather you from the east and from the west. I'm going to bring you to my holy mountain. I'm going to restore the earth. And Paul says, time's arrived. We're living in that very time. Well, to go back to something I said earlier, I think it's pretty obvious that Paul never, ever, ever went on any preaching tours to say, folks, in just a little bitty, little bitty, bitty, little bit, we're going to see, let me see, what terminology could I use? Oh, the redemption of creation. Paul never did that. He never said, folks, everybody go back to Jerusalem. Everybody go back to the land. Never. He said, do not set your mind on the things of the land. Exactly. Somebody wrote a little book on that. I think so. Yeah. Uh, See, That's a pretty good book, too, by the way. It it is. (laughs) Uh, Folks, a little levity there. I wrote a book entitled Misplaced Minds, an Exposition or Exegesis. Uh, Pardon me, Pardon me, Colossians chapter 3, in which Paul said, do not set your affections on things on the earth. And the great, great, great majority of commentators that I consulted in reading that, they have Paul saying, just don't be worldly minded. 
Well, okay, that's that's an axiomatic concept, but in the context of Colossians chapter 2, in which Paul is fighting the Judaizers who are teaching Gentiles, you got to keep the law of Moses. you got to keep the feast days, which means exactly. you've got to go to Jerusalem, which means you've got to hold the land of Israel as the holy land. And Paul says, <laughs> no, don't set your affection on the earth, on the land and the city and the temple and the priesthood and the sacrifices and the feast days. No, set your affection on things on the, in the heaven. Boy, that that was one of those epiphany moments, if you please, to me when I started seeing that and just started piecing it together. You know, Dre, you know, you were talking talking about seeing all the books on your desk before we came on air. air. Man, I was grabbing books, and just you know, had them stacked up as high. I said, oh, what does this one say? What does this one say? Getting into my logos, Bible study program, and what have you, and I was I was astounded absolutely astounded that I could not find a commentator who said in the context of his discussion of the Judaizers and de-emphasizing the Jerusalem cultists, the Jerusalem priesthood, and therefore the temple and therefore the land, not one of them ever said, it's better to render this passage in Colossians 3 as land, not one. That's that's bizarre considering the context and that Gi is used as the Roman, the local Roman land or Israel's local land. That's exactly right. Uh, so, uh, folks, you know, uh, go to my website, donkpreston.com. Go, go to the store and just look up Misplaced Minds and get yourself a copy of that book. Because you see, this is directly related to the concept of the episodagogi, which is which is the gathering into the new creation, the redemption of creation of Romans chapter 1, at the time of the destruction of the, quote, heaven and earth of Hebrews 1 and Psalms 102, that Doug Wilson says, oh, this hasn't happened. This is literal. It completely and totally overlooks the, the fundamental doctrines of the gathering of God's people back to him, the restoration of fellowship, the restoration of Eden, if you wish, want to put it in those term, in that terminology, it is the redemption of creation. It's just not the redemption of bugs, slugs, and mosquitoes. Yeah, and I, I like how our text in Psalm 102, verses 21 and 22, it says, when peoples gather together and kingdoms to worship the Lord, of course, I'm thinking of Isaiah 27 and mm -hmm. the gathering there, but I'm when we're talking about kingdoms, I'm also thinking Revelation chapter 11, <laughs> trying to you know the kingdoms plural shall be the kingdom singular I would take mm -hmm. of our Lord, and so there's that gathering and the healing of the nations, and so we have an eschatological gathering, we have an already, and we have an imminent not yet. And a lot of the partial preterists want to take that eschatological gathering in the Olivet Discourse as a post AD seventy, you know, mm -hmm. uh, evangelism, and it's it's just not that. It's the consummation of that gathering resurrection. And speaking of Revelation chapter eleven, verse fifteen, since we're discussing, you know, Doug Wilson, Doug Wilson takes Revelation eleven fifteen to nineteen as AD 70. Yeah. But, just but as we about. as we have noted, uh let me see, I've got his book right here. Yeah. As as we have noted in his book, uh when the man comes around, uh he takes Revelation chapter 11, 15 and following as fulfilled in AD 70. But he says literally, folks. Oh, your your volume went out. Oh. You, yeah, yeah, I put the go. book down on my button there. <laughs> You're back. Okay. Uh, but even though Doug Wilson says that Revelation 11, 15 and following was fulfilled in AD 70, what does he do? He completely omits any and all reference to the fact that it was the time of the dead that they should be judged, the time of the nations that they should be judged, and the time of the rewarding of the prophets for the time of your great wrath has come. Now he agrees the time of the wrath had come. He agrees the kingdoms of this world became the kingdom of, of, of our God and of his Christ. He just completely omits and ignores the rest of the text. He, he has surrendered. We say this as respectfully as possible. 
Doug Wilson, by admitting that Revelation 11, 15 and following is fulfilled in AD 70, has surrendered any futurist eschatology. When I talked to David Chilton a long time ago, when he was a partial preterist, I talked to him about his commentary on Revelation. He says, you know, it was really easy until I got to about chapter 11 and <laughs> onward. And uh, now, now I understand. I, oh, yeah. I, I see I, uh, what the problem is. It's funny you should say that because after he became a full preterist, I was talking to him, you know, at the 1997 Prophecy Conference in Oklahoma City that I helped sponsor. Uh, Dave and I were having this great conversation. I said, you know, Dave, I said, I used to read uh, your book, Paradise Restored, and I would read your commentary on Revelation. And I said, I would say to myself, how in the world could anybody say the things that you were saying and still be a partial preterist? And he looked at me and grinned. He said, I wonder it's the same thing. <laughs> I, I completely lost it. You know, he was one of the funniest guys I'd ever met. Absolutely. He really was. Yeah. Okay. Hey, folks, we're out of time. We've got more on episode of Gogi, the gathering, the redemption uh, that we'll pick up on our next program. In the meantime, thanks for joining us so much. Great to be with you again, Mike. Really enjoyed it. Yes. Take care, brother. We'll talk next you, week. You bet. All right. I love that. That went good. We, it's, it's a vast, vast oh, subject. It, it's, I mean, it's, it's really going to climax there probably in Matthew 24, 31 and Isaiah 27. Absolutely. And, and, what, and what that is, but. Uh, or in second Thessalonians chapter two, don't forget. Yeah. Episodagogi. They thought it's already passed. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I'd, I'd ask Gary DeMar about that passage. And I said, do you take the, the gathering there as, as the resurrection? And he says, yeah, because he, because he now takes, and this is what we'll talk about next time. Like Jordan, he takes that gathering in Matthew 24, 31 as the resurrection of the old Testament dead ones. Thank along you. Along with <laughs> those who had died in Christ, the martyrs being raised in AD 70. So now once we get into first Corinthians 15, <laughs> You know, it's it's this it's is... all there, and I think that's why these guys really came hard after Gary. Oh yeah, um, because I think once he made that connection, that it's no longer a post AD seventy evangelism gathering. Yeah, but it's actually a resurrection, a spiritual resurrection of the Old Testament dead ones and those who had died in Christ. At that point, the floodgates are open. Oh yeah, I, I uh, you you don't have anywhere else to go. No, I, I don't think so. Hey, I got to go eat, man. Yeah, go get Good you night, some bread, man. Good night.